Never was it God's intention for us to live a life with anxiety, for us to live a life of stress. God's heart and desire was for us to always be in unity and alignment with Him. And so we are going to offer something that is called the blessed life. It is a financial stewardship study that is truly going to change the way you think about finances. God's intention from the very beginning was for us to trust Him because He wanted our hearts to be aligned with Him and He wanted to have a life of blessings for us. Tithing is a principle that is all over the Bible. In Genesis chapter 14, 19 through 20, this was the first example of a tithe. It says, And He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram, God most high possessor of heaven and earth and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand and Abraham gave him a tenth of everything as God continued to lead people and as God continued to challenge those we see over scripture and over and over that the tithe was something that he wanted us to take serious and the only topic in the entire Bible that he actually asked us to test him in Malachi chapter 3 verse 8 9 it says will a man rob God yet you are robbing me but you say how have I robbed you and he says in your tithes and contributions you are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me the whole nation of you and this was just a moment where God was reminding those that followed him that there's a better way of living we talk about tithing, we talk about giving every week at South Hills. We wanna take six weeks to walk you through a journey that is going to transform your heart and transform your life. And we're gonna be offering it on a Tuesday evening at 6.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time where you can log in online. So I'm gonna ask you to take some time to join us on this series. And our CFO is actually gonna be hosting and leading us through it. His name is Steve Robinson, and you can email him to reserve your spot, steve.robinson at southhills.org. Don't want you to miss it. Why? Because it truly is going to bless your life. to see you guys. <clears throat> Thanks for coming out and spending uh, part of your Sunday here with us. Um, if I haven't got a chance to meet you, my name is Adam, and I am the campus pastor here at our Corona campus. And uh, we are in the, the very middle of this series called Defeating Depression about how to deal with your dark side. And uh, we're going to continue down that path today. But before we dive into uh, the content today, there's one quick thing that I just wanted to uh, bring you in on, and that is beginning in June, so two Sundays from now, we are going to, uh, we're going to shift our service times. And so uh, right now we have been at an 8.30, 10, and 11.30 format, and we're going to make a, 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 like a really small adjustment just for uh, the summer. We're going to move to a 9 and 11. So I want to bring you guys in on this because obviously um, you're here at 10, and so that is is right between these two, and so you're going to want to slide one direction or the other. Uh, if you get here at 10, it will we'll just be wrapping it up, and you'll have missed all the good stuff that just happened, or you're just really early for the next one trying to get donuts, so either way is okay, um, but uh, we, we want to actually just sort of loosen the schedule up, provide more time between services, as in fact, as our kids' numbers have really uh, skyrocketed since the beginning of the year, and so we're needing more turnaround time to check in and check out kids, and we don't want people to feel rushed at our church. We think that some of the best time uh, that you can spend here at church is just the in-between time, the kind of hangout, just talking and shooting the breeze with people out on the plaza, enjoying the activities, and, um, and just meeting new friends out there. And we don't want to cut that short. And so um, for summer, as some of you are going to be on vacation and doing different things, uh, we're going to adjust to this time slot. But I do want to encourage you this, that when you pick the time slot that you're going to attend, also think about where you want to serve. Uh, because it does take a lot of volunteers to actually pull off the service structure and the kind of welcoming environment that we love to create in all of our uh, venues on a Sunday. And so maybe you're going to want to serve as an usher or a greeter or a part of the setup or teardown team. Maybe you 
have uh, a passion to serve with kids. Um, there are a lot of different volunteer opportunities in all these spaces. And I want to just encourage you to consider what would it look like just to serve, maybe just even for the summer, in one of these two time slots. And uh, so June, the beginning of June, we're going to be jump-starting a brand new series uh, along with brand new service times. And so write these down. Make sure that you're aware and other people in your orbit are aware so that you are actually here for the proper service time. So um, with that said, uh, we're going to jump into today's message. And uh, I want to encourage you to take some notes, write down some things that stand out to you or that you just want to think more about or consider, have conversations about um, as you go from here. And the title of my message today is, What Are They Doing? What Are They Doing? Um, my, uh, my wife and I, we have three kids, and uh, our oldest is uh, a girl, a Tegan, and she is well into the teenage years, and, and my younger two are boys. And my oldest son, is uh, get, like he's counting down to his 13th birthday, so he's getting real close. And um, there's a lot of things that he's like starting to shift. And those of you that have either hit those preteen years or get into that stage, there's that shift of like moving from sort of like a handful of childhood interests to like what is it to be a grown-up. And so my son has been like, you know, taking note of things that are manly and trying to like inch his way into that world. And um, a couple months ago, he was like, Dad, I feel like it might be time for me to... Um, start going to the gym. And uh, I was like, yeah, we can do that. Let's do that. And so we, uh, we started going to the gym together. I started bringing him to Choose Fitness with me. And we started doing these workouts. And, and he's, he's an intense kid. He takes things really seriously. There's actually something I really like about him. And so he has this little, you know, thing where he writes down, like, the workouts. And we, like, we, we do all the stuff. And he knows what we do on different days. And probably about three or four workouts into it, <clears throat> we're doing a workout. And I notice he's like kind of looking around the room and taking a lot of things in, and and um, I'm doing a set, and he's sort of waiting, and he's just like, "Dad, um, how long is it going to take before I start seeing some progress?" <laughs> and I could see he's looking at different people around, and I'm just like, "I mean, we've only done three workouts, so more than that, okay? It's going to take a, a good stretch of time. Like you got to kind of keep doing the thing over and over and over again." Um, so before you actually start seeing progress, you know, and he was hoping to see it like three moves in. Um, and so that makes him an American. And so you're welcome. You're, you're in, you know, you've got a lot of people who think of the same way. And I, I noticed he's looking around the room and, and, and he's sort of thoughtfully looking at one specific guy who's just like jacked up over on the side. And he's like, Dad, maybe we should ask that guy what he's doing because he looks way tougher than you. <laughs> and I was like, okay, offensive. Um, and I could tell he was, he, like, the, the gears were moving that he was thinking about this in two ways. I think, one, he was thinking, like, listen, I am trying to get ripped up and fit, okay? And I'm looking at you, Dad, and I'm looking at that guy, and I'm thinking, you might not know what you're doing, okay? To which I'm just like, it's not that I don't know what I'm doing. It's that I like cheese, okay? I like cheese a lot, I know what to do, and I'm even doing a lot of the right things in here, but it's like there's a combination of other stuff. Okay, that guy doesn't know more than me, all right? And also, it just takes time, right? It takes a long time of doing the same thing, repeating the same thing over and over and over again before you get the results that you want to. That guy has been in here a lot of days, okay? I know because I've been coming to this gym a long time, and he is in here all the times I'm in here. I, he might live here. I'm not sure. I've never seen him go home, and also I'm pretty sure he's on steroids. So there's other things that he's doing, but also the stretch of time thing, right? And I get that he looks tougher, but part of that's just the face tattoo. And your mom said, I can't pull it off. And so I'm not going to be able to do that. But uh, trust me, okay, I will not lead you astray. And I think we all hit these points in our life where, you know, maybe there's something that we want to do or achieve or we want to get better at. Maybe we notice there's a deficit in our life and we start looking around at maybe who is doing that thing and who's uh, achieving in that area. And we're like, what are they doing? Okay, because they seem to be making progress where I feel stuck. And I think we all do this thing. Like we want to know why uh, the people who are doing well are doing well in whatever the thing is that we're focused on. And I think this is especially true when the thing that they're having success with is something that we've always struggled with or maybe we're currently struggling with. We're like, man, I feel like I am trying everything I know how to do and I'm not getting the progress like you. And so what are you doing? What are they doing? 
And I told Cohen, I'm like, you can go talk to that guy, though, if you want to. And he did not. He did not go over there and ask that guy, like, what are you doing? You seem way tougher than my dad. Um, and maybe he didn't want to embarrass me. Maybe he didn't want to embarrass himself. Maybe he didn't want to embarrass this guy. Um, but I think a lot of us, we have that same sort of dynamic, right, where we see someone making progress in an area where we feel stuck, and we don't ask, what are you doing? Like, what, what is happening? Sometimes it's, it's due to the embarrassment. Sometimes it's because we think we already know what they're going to say. You ever do that? You're just like, I know what you're going to say, and I already know that doesn't work for me. I mean, yes, I've never tried it, but I can just assume that it's not going to be something that would help me. And other times, I think it's that we are in a spot where we're like, I know I need help, but I'm not sure with what yet. Because I can sense that maybe something is off in my life, but I, I don't really exactly know what or who to ask about it. And I think this is especially true when it comes to us not doing well maybe emotionally. When there's a heaviness on us, when we're going through a tough or a dark season, where like I can feel that something is off, but I, I don't know what. And a lot of us, again, a very American trait is we're just like, what if I just, I'll just push it down and never reference it and hope it goes away? Because I don't want to have to actually have the, con the conversation. And of course, that doesn't help. And I bring this up because there's this moment in um, one of like the heroes of our faith, this guy named the Apostle Paul, credited with having written most of the New Testament. Some people would be like, this guy is the most spiritual you could possibly get next to Jesus. And he hits this moment in his life before, uh, before he becomes a Christian, before he becomes a follower of Jesus. He, he thinks he's following God. He thinks he's trying to do the right things. But he has this sense in his life that something is off, but he doesn't know what. And some of it is his approach to life, right? He has this thought that, like, Jesus followers are probably, like, they're probably some of the people who are causing the problems. Uh, and he needs to, like, get rid of them by any means necessary. And he goes at this full tilt. We see a little bit of a story in the book of Acts, chapter 9, verse 1. It says that, that Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So it's not like a casual weekend hobby, right? This is a real obsession with this guy. And he is going hard after this thing. Like when, when you are so focused on something that it consumes your every breath, you are all in. And yet we look at this and we'll be like, that may not be the best thing to be all in about. Killing the Lord's followers? Like, mm, that's probably not what I would revolve my life around. Um, but in his mind, he actually thinks that he is doing God uh, a favor. Like, he believes that he's focused on the right things, that he actually is living his best life, that, that the Jesus followers are the ones who have it wrong, and that he's going to set the world right by, by getting at them. And it's in the midst of him going about this that this bright light, as the legend has it, this bright light hits him as he's going to round up and kill a bunch of Christians. And it knocks him to the ground. It literally and figuratively knocks him off his high horse. And this voice, this booming voice from the sky is like, you need to rethink how you're living. It says later on in Acts chapter 9, verse 8, that Saul picked himself up off the ground. And, and yet when he opened his eyes, he was blind. And so his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. It was like the nearest city. And he remained there blind for three days, and he didn't eat or drink. What happens is for the first time in who knows how long, Saul, who has sort of, was sort of tamping down the anxiety or depression inside of him, he was sort of, he was sort of managing it through perfectionism and through like aiming his anger at certain groups of people and just staying active as much as he could. Finally, for the first time in a long time, he slows down long enough to reflect on the way he's living because he doesn't have a choice. He's stuck, blind, and what he starts to see about himself and his life depresses him. He can't eat or sleep. And I think in some ways, like, this reference to him being blind is a metaphor because he hasn't seen a lot of things clearly for a really long time, including how he was getting in his own way. And he begins to question everything. He begins to realize that, like, I'm not really who I want to be. 
Like, I, I've, be, I've overvalued and pursued a lot of things that aren't really working to make me happy. I think I'm doing what God wants me to do, but I actually might be doing the opposite. I might be unintentionally working against everything that I deeply want in life. And I think a lot of us, we hit these same sorts of places too. And a lot of times the reaction is very similar. Because the reality of it is, a, a sudden disruption like this can trigger depression, it happened to Saul, and I think it, it can happen to a lot of us. Something unexpected happens to sort of slow down or stop or push pause on whatever it is we're doing in life. And that disruption throws us into a depression. And I know this is going to sound crazy, but I think sometimes it's a gift. Now, we don't want to believe that because depression does not feel good. But some depressive episodes are actually our body's way of telling us that something about the way we're doing life is off. It's telling us that we, we can't keep doing what we're doing the same way we're doing it much longer because it's taking its toll. It's our soul's way of inviting us to maybe make a change. And Saul is sitting in the dark, blind, aware of his blindness, mulling over his life, sitting in all this uncomfortable, dark awareness for three days, and then God sends him help. It says in Acts chapter 9, verse 17, that this guy named Ananias, who's a Christian, goes to see Saul, which is very brave, because this guy is like, if I was him, I'd be like, he's playing a trick, okay? He's pretending he's blind, and then he's going to be like, ha-ha, I can see, and he's going to stab me, I'm going to die. Okay, this guy's trying to kill Christians. I don't trust it. But he goes, and it says he lays his hands on him and says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he regains his sight and then he gets up and he gets baptized. And afterwards, he ate some food to regain his strength. So to just to summarize this, this, a Christian mentor sort of shows up in his life, prays for him, counsels him. This is a discipleship, right? Care, advice. He receives the Holy Spirit which we got a whole series we're going to talk about later on this summer. But essentially, he receives this sense of divine wisdom and power and strength and guidance, and he gains clarity. He gains this understanding of the next steps that he needs to take moving forward, and then he eats something. He's taking care of his physical body. All these things needed to get his life back on track. And then what? And then what? After this moment. I think when we're depressed our tendency is to ask this question. How do I get out of this as quickly as possible so I can get back to my normal life? But maybe, maybe that's not the point. Maybe that actually would put you right back where you are right now. This is why I actually think that, that medication alone doesn't work, right? And this is the mentality of a lot of our culture of just like, oh, if you can't do all the things that you should be doing culturally, just take a pill and then get right back to what you were doing. And, and yet I think a lot of this is sort of a misunderstanding of what medication is and what it's for. Medication doesn't fix feelings or numb negativity. It gives a person agency to take action and adjust their way of life. Because if you don't do that thing, no matter what meds you're on and how great they are, you will eventually end up right back where you started. And Paul, he sort of has this divine experience where the darkness that he's been like depressed and sitting in for three days, it lifts supernaturally. He's having one of these sort of light moments. And I think for a lot of us, we would be like, oh, Thank God that's over. Time to get back to what I was doing. And yet, Paul understands maybe this is not the smart move. It, he's reflecting on this time in his life in a letter that he writes later to the Galatians. And in chapter 1, verse 16, he says this. When, when all this stuff happened, everything that we just talked about from the book of Acts, I went away to Arabia, which is where the mountain of God is, to pray. And later I returned to the city of Damascus. This is where like, his first Christian mentors were. And then three years later, I went to Jerusalem to get to know Peter, who is the, the follower of Jesus, the disciple who becomes the head of the very first church. And I stayed with him for 15 days. In other words, 
Like Saul doesn't go right back to doing exactly what he was doing before. And he doesn't like instantly jump into something ahead without really thinking about it. Think about this. He takes more than three years to rearrange his life. We're talking praying, learning, shifting his thinking, putting new people around him, practicing new rhythms before moving forward. And this is the question I have for you. How much time do you give to reflecting on and reorganizing your life when you hit a wall? Do you do that at all? Or do you just do sort of the um, American thing, the impulsive thing of just like, man, I got I to gotta get back out there. Do you just keep sprinting and sprinting, wondering why your life isn't working? And if you did need to make a change, where would you need to make it? And how would you make that change? Because here's what I will tell you of the people who are actually experiencing um, some health. They're actually moving forward and getting some relief to the long-term depression they're experiencing in life. Uh, they're, they're doing certain things that I think uh, Saul, who becomes Paul, does here. Because the truth is maintaining our mental health requires that we acknowledge and address our pace, our patterns, our predicaments, and our perceptions. Our pace, patterns, predicaments, and perceptions. And I think that this was a lot of what Paul did in this sort of missing three years after his breakdown, before he begins his ministry. He recalibrates his life so that he can stay mentally and emotionally healthy. Now, I want to break down what these things are and what they mean, because for us to actually maintain our mental health, um, we're going to have to look at these things as well. And so let's start with the first one, because that seems like a logical place to start. Pace, right? And what we mean by pace is how fast we go and how much we do. You ever sink into a, a season of sadness because you're running yourself ragged? Two people said yes, a lot of liars in here, because this is the way we do it especially in California. It's a pacing issue. Like a lot of us are going too quick, trying to do too much, more than is actually um, we're able to do. But pacing isn't always about slowing down. Sometimes it's actually about speeding up because we're different types of people, right? Some of us need to edit and some of us need to add because we don't all live the same existence. Sometimes life feels meaningless because we're not doing enough meaningful activities, Sometimes I, I sit with people who are like, I'm just in a really tough spot. And I'm like, what do you do? Like, give me the course of your day. And they, they begin to unpack like a full week's worth of things. And they're like, so that's Tuesday. And I'm like, what? And I'm like, what is most meaningful out of that? And they're like, I don't know. So they're doing a lot, but not a lot that brings meaning into their life. Other times I'll talk to people and I'm like, well, what are you doing? And they're like, nothing, man. I mean, I play video games. I smoke a lot of weed. Uh, that's kind of it at this stage of my life, you know. I roll my eyes at my mom. You know, just the classics. And I'm like, man, you, you, it sounds like you've got some time to squeeze some meaningful, you know, activities in there. Uh, life can feel meaningless because we're not doing anything meaningless. And it's not that life is meaningless. It may just be that your life at this moment is meaningless because you're not doing anything meaningful. It's a pacing problem. And the truth is, every one of us runs at a different pace. We don't all run at the same pace. Like, your pace isn't going to look like everybody around you, including your partner and maybe even those in your family. And this can create a lot of tension. When maybe some of you have figured this out, where you married someone, you're like, I bet we're going to want to do all the same things at the same speed all the same time. And then very quickly, you're like, wow, this is, we are not the same. And then when you have kids, that introduces another point of tension, right, where you have to negotiate. And then, I'll be honest, this is a point of tension in my family because I like to run a much slower pace than the other people in my family. They could do things 24 hours a day. I require, like, more, like, like just being alone with my thoughts and self-reflection and being calm sort of time. My daughter needs zero of this in her life, right, and she gets that from her mother. Right? So, like, we have to negotiate how to make life and pacing work for all of us inside of our relationships. So, the question I have for you is, like, when's the last time you had a pacing conversation with those that you share life with? 
And has anything changed since you had that conversation? Maybe some of you are like, yeah, we definitely did that. 1978. Uh, you know what? Maybe a couple things have changed since then. Maybe it might be time to revisit if the pace of your relationship is still working. What do you do? At what pace? What fills you and drains you? What breaks do you need? What things might you need to opt out of because they take too big of a toll on you? What things might you need to adjust because the current expectations on those things are too much or maybe even too little? Second thing is, is our patterns, which I would describe as how we repetitively respond to discomfort and disappointment, right? We all have sort of like automatic reactions when life doesn't go the way that we want it to. And a, life, a lot of us, we do certain things frequently because that's how, we, uh, that's how we define worth and safety. That's why we feel like we can't stop doing it even when we start hating it. Because it's familiar. We're like, I have to work this much overtime. I hate it. But like, that's what makes me valuable. I have to say yes to everything anyone asks me because that's the only thing people like about me. This is a pattern. And first of all, that's probably not even true. But second of all, let's say that it was. That doesn't mean that it's healthy for you, that it's a good thing for you, that it's working for you. And a lot of times we, we don't know how or we don't want to admit to or face or uh, go through the, the work of changing our patterns, and so we just try and get as far away from our current life as we can. I know so many people who have ended a relationship, a marriage, or even moved halfway across the country just to avoid having to address their own patterns. But maybe, maybe you don't need to move or quit or break up. Maybe what you need to do is learn to draw some boundaries or learn to say no, or learn to take more active care of your body, or learn to trade late night social media scrolling for maybe a reflective journaling practice. Because here's the reality. If you alter your situation without addressing any of your habits, you will stay stuck. Because that's how you work. And you'll find yourself being like, wow, I am super depressed, but in an exciting new location. I still hate my life, but at a new job with different pressures. Right? I'm still sad a lot of the time. But, you know, with a new partner who gets to be frustrated that I'm not what they thought all over again. It's, it's exciting. And a lot of it is because we, we haven't faced our patterns. So the question for you is, when was the last time that you actually combed through your patterns and determined which ones were helping you and which ones were hurting you? Because the same pattern can do different things to different people. And you've had this experience before where you've talked to someone, you're like, they're like, I need to take a break and just like rejuvenate. And they're like, what are you going to do? And they're like, well, I was just, I was thinking I was going to, you know, organize my garage and then run a marathon. And you're like, ooh. And they're like, it's just going to fill me up. And you're like, that would be, that would be a red flag, a sign that I was about to kill myself, okay? That's like the darkest I can imagine life being, okay? That's not for me at all, right? Because we're different, right? Different sorts of responses or reactions are, are different for different ones of us. And so who are you? How do you work? What's invigorating for one person may be draining to another person and vice versa. And so who are you? What works for you? I think a lot of the, the pattern conversation in a lot of our lives as it relates to our, our mental and emotional health, has to do with, with exchanging an automatic uh, reaction with an intentional response, right? When something disappointing or discouraging comes into our life, we all have this knee jerk, like, well, I do this, and that, that's how I try and, like, feel better. And sometimes that thing is tanking us and making the problem worse, but we can't change it until we become aware of it. And then we can aim our lives or our reactions and responses in a different direction. The third thing we have to address is our predicaments, which I would define as what's happening to and around us and what it requires of us. Because if you have certain ideals and expectations that don't factor in your current reality, you are going to feel frustrated constantly. Because everybody is not in the same stage of life and everybody is not working with the same exact situation. Sometimes we need to adjust our expectations based on reality. 
I were like, man, I should have more in savings by now. And it's like you literally graduated college four days ago, okay? And you live in the most expensive place, like, in the United States and also inflation. So maybe just give yourself a little bit of a break there. Like, I feel like, I feel like um, you know, I should be in better shape. You had a baby five days ago, okay? So let's maybe just give that a rest, right? Maybe, like, consider your situation and what's going on and where you're at in life before you put all this pressure on yourself to do something that's unrealistic given your stage of life. Sometimes it's not the expectation that necessarily needs to shift, but the situation itself. Like, man, I don't like working this hard. Maybe this isn't the job for you. I hate that I feel so financially strapped all the time. Maybe, you know, return the lease. Okay, that car may not be, maybe get a bike, skateboard. Maybe, I know you're 40, but your mom, she would be willing to drive you places. Maybe that's how you could create some, I don't know, there's ideas is all I'm saying. So here's the question for this. Like, where are you stressed because you are ignoring the specifics of your situation? Like, where might you need to adjust your expectations? Like, oh, I should be here. I should have accomplished this. I should have done that. Should you have, though, given X, Y, and C? Or where uh, are you regularly upset about something that you already have the ability to change? You're frustrated. And you're like, oh, I wish. That. And it's like, well, you don't have to wish. You could just actually change that thing. What would that look like for you? And then, of course, there's this fourth category of perceptions which is essentially how we see situations and what we echo again and again to ourselves. We can all get to this place where we develop this skewed view of reality, of situations, of ourselves, of our experiences, and it colors the way we see everything. We get these sort of negative assumptions or thought patterns trapped in our minds, and they hold us hostage. And maybe there's a part of you that's just like, I know that this thing that I keep thinking is probably not the whole story, but it feels like the whole story, and I keep echoing it and leaning into it. And what's the solution here? I mean, maybe you've been told, like, listen, just think positively. You need some positive affirmations. And there is, a, like, a, there is a catch with this. Positive affirmations don't work if they're not true because your brain is way too smart for that. Right? If you're repeating something to yourself that you're like, it's positive, but it's a lie, right? It doesn't really do anything for you. You can look in the mirror all you want to and just be like, you are every bit as beautiful as Margot Robbie. And part of your brain's gonna be like, nah, not really. I mean, we're doing the best we can with what we got, but she got other things, okay? So that's not really entirely true. You can't brainwash yourself with a set of lies because your brain will just be like, well, that's not real. What does help is focusing on the positive realities of your actual situation. Like here's, here would be like a good, a helpful positive affirmation that's actually based on truth. Nobody's opinion who you actually care about evaluates you based on your looks. So go to the dinner anyway because it'd be worth being with those people is going to uplift you because that's true. That's something that you can actually build your life around and take action as a result of. So what assumptions do you make about the world and what's valuable and how people see or think about you? And the, how are these, accepts, the, these assumptions, how do they make you feel and are they even accurate? What negative looping idea might you need to pay less attention to? Or give less credibility to. I know some of you are looking at these four things. The pace, patterns, predicaments, perceptions. The first year of all, you're like, congratulations for uh, your use of a thesaurus. We're, we're all very proud. But maybe you're also thinking like, okay, I, I see how this would be helpful to some people. Not me. Because I can't even get out of bed. Some days, I don't even know if I want to live. Like, I don't even feel like I have the strength to begin to address this stuff. And so it doesn't matter how much I know I need to, I don't feel like I can. And to you, I just want to say, you might be right. Severely 
depressed people, what, what depression actually does, it disables our ability to think logically about cause and effect and analyze situations and intelligently plan for the future. And so if you don't have that cognitive ability, it's difficult to take action in these particular areas. And that is why there is a, a fifth thing, and it also starts with a P, you're welcome. Your physiology, your physiology, which is how well your brain chemistry is functioning. This is sort of the base level that if it's not working well, it affects your ability to even do the other things. And I want to sort of paint a picture of how this works. There's this really interesting story that Jesus uses in Matthew chapter 7 about uh, people that are building houses and they're building them some on sand and some on, um, on solid rock. And he's using it to make a point about spiritual health. But I, I want to leverage this same idea to just sort of like increase your awareness of how mental health works. These first four Ps you have to do, like anybody has to do in order to build a functional, successful, enjoyable life. The issue is not everyone is starting with the same foundation. Someone who is deeply depressed is like somebody who is trying to build something on a faulty foundation, biologically speaking. It's like trying to construct a house on quicksand, and so no matter how, how great the build is and how amazing the materials are and the skill that you use, you get done and it just sort of sinks down into the muck. Because that particular person may have a whole lot of other work to do before they begin the build to solidify the soil. And it would be easy for other people who are starting in a different place, who are beginning on a different foundation physiologically or biologically or uh, in terms of brain chemistry to say, like, I, I don't know why it's so hard for you. Just do this. It's easy. That's all I did. And the depressed person is thinking, like, I, I, I am doing those things. I did do those things. What's wrong with me? It's not working. And this is what the right kind of psychiatric medication does. It helps you convert the quicksand into solid rock so that you can build. It doesn't replace the need to build. It gives you the ability to build your life. And if you're in a really dark place, building that foundation first is probably going to require some professional help. And so what kind? Like what kind of help do you need and where do you go to get it to build out the foundation of your physiology so that you can begin to pay attention to building out the life based on these other four Ps. I want to sort of give you an, an overview and some just really practical stuff about the four things that I think are particularly helpful. I want to talk about medication, supplementation, talk therapy, and physical therapy. Medication, when I say that, I'm, I'm talking about prescription psychiatric medication. I just want to tell you, this is a process, okay? If you've never been through the process of seeing a psychiatrist, I have. Let me tell you how it works, okay? You're going to go in. You're going to have a meeting with this person. They're going to evaluate you. They're going to run some tests. They're going to do some interviews. And then they are going to probably prescribe something uh, for you to take. But here's the catch with that. Most psych meds take 30 to 60 days of regular usage to be able to actually evaluate whether or not they're accurately working for you. And that's a stretch of time. And on top of that, most people don't find the perfect fit during the first round of prescriptions. So it takes some time. Like in the, just being real, in the last 20 years, I have taken 10 to 12 different combinations of about eight different um, medications because one didn't work or it didn't work in combination with this or like, you know, things changed in my life or it stopped working and it had to be reevaluated again or combined with something else. And now like I'm leveraging something that works well enough for me to actually have the agency to work on myself. And I'll tell you, in order to actually get medication that's going to help you in the right direction, it's going to take time and patience and probably some trial and error. The second category is supplementation. So by this I mean like diet, nutrition, vitamins. Your, your body may be devoid of something, preventing it from functioning properly. So you may need to see your doctor about getting a blood test or an allergy test. 
you you may the issue may need to may be that you need to like you know you need more protein in your diet or less sugar or less caffeine or less alcohol or heroin. I don't know what you're using, okay? But these substances get in the way and they reconfigure the way our brain works, right? You might be allergic to gluten or low in iron. You may need to eat more or less or different things or in different increments or intervals um, because people are different. Their bodies are different. And depending on your lifestyle, you may be depleted in one thing or another. You're going to have to learn your body, and that takes time. Then there's talk therapy, which uh, underneath this I would say is, you know, licensed therapists, counseling, peer support groups, recovery programs like the one we have here, Celebrate Recovery. Um, all these things sort of fi- fall, fall under this category. One thing I would tell you is, you know, fi- like finding a therapist is, is a lot like dating. So it, it would be ridiculous for you to go on one date with one person and not click with them and just be like, you know what, love's not for me. Guess I'm done. Guess I'm destined to be, like we would look at that and be like, that's a little bit crazy. Maybe go on a couple more dates with that person or maybe like you know, there's other people than just that one. And it's like, no, no, I've sampled and I've seen, done, right? I would tell you, like, it, it takes a bit more work, right? It takes more work, especially with a therapist, to find one that you like and respect and click with and find helpful. And here's what I've learned. You will not take advice from somebody you don't like. So it doesn't matter how educated they are or how smart they are or the fact that they help your friend. If you were in a session with somebody and you're just like, I hate her. Something about her just grating. I don't like it, right? Like, you find somebody else, right? Go out there and find somebody else who fits better with you because it's not going to work for you. Don't give up altogether. Shop around. Look at their education, their style, their values. Chemistry can take a few sessions. Like, even if it's somebody who's great, it can take a while for you to find your flow, just like in dating, right? I repeated this to my wife a lot when we started, you know, after the 27th date and the 41st date. I'm like, it takes, sometimes it takes time to hit that chemistry, you know, and again, on our 10-year anniversary, she's like, when are we going to hit the stride, babe? When are we going to? I would also tell you this. No matter how good your therapist is, they can only help you to the extent you are honest with them about your life and to the extent you're willing to put in work. Because a, a, a therapist cannot give you great advice about a situation you're lying about. And also, if they make a suggestion about a baby step to take and you don't take it and come back and say, what should I do now? And they're like, did you do the thing I suggested last time? And you're like, no. If I was your therapist, I would be like, I don't know what to tell you. I already gave you an action step and you're too cool for it. Okay, and so I don't, you've got to put in the work for this to work. And the fourth thing is physical therapy. So underneath this umbrella, exercise stretching, chiropractic care, massage, acupuncture, um, a good sleep routine, and I do all of these things. The, the thing that I would tell you has made the biggest impact in my life um, is probably maybe about seven years ago, I went through like a deep depressive episode, and I was taking my medication, and I was going to therapy, and I was doing things I should do, but it's like I was, I was bottoming out. And I went to my doctor, and we were talking about it, and she was like, would you be willing to do a sleep study? Um, because maybe you're not getting enough sleep. My wife was like, he's sleeping all the time. So it's <laughs> probably not that. And they're like, yeah, but is he actually getting, just because he's laying there doesn't mean he's actually getting good deep REM sleep. And so I went to the sleep study and then something about it didn't work and they made me go back and I had to do it again. They hook you up to all these electrodes. And they brought me back in, and they were just like, okay, well, we know what it is. You definitely have a, a, a sleep disorder. I'm like, why did I have to do it twice? And like, because we thought it was wrong the first time. And I'm like, was it? And they're like, no, it was the same reading. And I'm like, well, what's the deal? And they're like, we made you do it twice because, just to be honest, we don't know how you're still alive. A real doctor told me that. You are not getting enough deep sleep to actually power a human. And we need to get you some help with your sleep as soon as possible. And I was like, wow. 
And so they, they fitted me for um, a CPAP machine, and they gave me some tips on how to organize a better sleep schedule for myself. I remember like going to get the machine, and the, the doctor handed it over, and they're like, normally we tell people, hey, this is going to change your life. But i got to be honest, this is going to change your personality. And they handed it over to me. And it kind of did, honestly. Imagine, like, think about yourself, like, how cranky and sad and irrational and down you are when you don't sleep for, like, a couple days. Now, imagine you have not slept for years. What would that do to you? One of the things they asked me at the time, they're like, they're like, yeah, we don't know how you're still alive. Do you have a job? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, are you good at it? I'm like, well, I don't know now. Now I feel like I don't know what's real. <laughs> Maybe, hopefully I'll get better. Now maybe you're thinking like, man, that, I hate hearing this. I mean, it's helpful, but I hate it because it just feels like that's a lot of stuff. Like this is more work than other people have to do just to function. And you know what? You're right. Because we're not all the same. And life is not fair. And there are people, I would tell you, not just with, with mental health issues, but with even physical disabilities that would throw themselves into the same thing and be like, yeah, yeah, I have to do a lot more than other people just to function, and that's not fair. And it's not. One thing you may notice about all these things pulled together is that most of these things that will improve our mental health, like they're not quick things. They're not instantaneous. They're part of an ongoing incremental process. And that can feel frustrating because we want a quick fix. We want to be better now. Whether it's us or somebody that we love and care about, we just want it to be done. It's frustrating that we have to, like, like check in with all these things and do these things and check these boxes and work on these different areas of our existence. And if you're annoyed about that, I want to tell you, I am also annoyed about that. And it's not just us. The Apostle Paul was also very annoyed about that. Let me just read you, like, a really validating verse. This is something that Saul, who becomes Paul, the story we were reading about earlier, this is something he says. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. He says, I was given a thorn in my flesh. A messenger from Satan to torment me. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. And each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. Now Paul never says exactly what that thorn is. Some scholars think that maybe it was failing eyesight. Others think that maybe he had like some sort of like, you know, like permanent injury from all the beatings that he took over his life. But a lot of scholars have come to believe that he may have had a mood disorder, either depression or maybe even bipolar, and it just wouldn't lift. And that makes a lot of sense to me. Satan literally means accuser or oppressor, and that to me is a great description of depression. This barrage of accusations and negative spiraling thoughts and weighted weakness. And we like Paul, we just want God to take it away. In fact, when I read Paul, I'm like, only three times you ask him to take it away? <laughs> that's when I'm bottoming out. It's like, oh, that's all I'm talking to God about. You got to get me out of this. You got to take this away. But Paul also says this. In another letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, verse 12, he says, I, I haven't reached perfection, but I, I press on to reach the end of the race. Maybe you're like, perfection, that seems a little like I'm never going to be perfect. But the word perfection here means whole or connected or at peace. And he's saying, like, I haven't reached a place in my life right now here on earth where I feel whole all the time, where I feel connected all the time, where I feel at peace all the time. I'm not there. But I, I will tell you this, I, I'm going to press on to reach the end of the race. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. There's more that God has for me to do. I think what he's saying here is like, you know, I have tried so hard for so long, and it is harder for me than I want it to be, but I, I'm going to keep trusting God and fighting my way forward because I am lovable 
and my life is purposeful and I choose to believe that this is true even when it doesn't feel true. And I printed this all out for you because for some of you, you may need to echo this to yourself as a mantra because this does not feel true to you. There's something that is reassuring and inspiring to me that the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest Christians who ever lived, the only reason that you and I know who Jesus is and have access to God's word is because of Paul. It's reassuring to me that he was someone who likely struggled with deep end depression. Because day by day, moment by moment, one foot in front of the other, he trusted God. He took control of the things he could control. And he fought his way forward. And he had a lot less tools than we do. I just want to tell you, like, God wants to work in your life. And sometimes the way he does it is through doctors and medication and recovery groups and growth groups and having a habit of going to church and physical exercise and a nutritionist. God is so creative that he creates as many avenues as possible to give you access to life to the full. Because God loves you. And he wants this for you. And I want to pray this into your life today. Maybe as you look at this statement, it feels fake to you. I think there were times it felt fake to Paul. But this is what is real. And if we can grab hold of this and slowly move forward, we can get better. Would you bow your heads with me across this room as we pray? God, I thank you so much for the life that you have given us. Life is complicated. It's hard. And, and God, I think that there are so many things that are harder about living in our society in terms of our mental health and everything that's flying at us at, at, from every angle at every moment than it was way, way back in the day. But you, you, you don't leave us stranded or leave us hanging. God, you want to give us help step by step to move forward inside of our own story. And God, I pray that we would believe that we are lovable, that this life is livable, God, we would grab hold of the things that you have put in our path in order for us to access help and health and that we would begin to step-by-step step inch our way towards wholeness, connectedness, perfection, peace. That's not about living somebody else's idea of perfection, but, but simply being the whole person that you've designed us to be. God, I pray that we would lean into you and your way and you would guide us forward. God, as we are willing to put in the work that only we can do, God, may we trust that behind the scenes that you are doing much more than we could ever do on our behalf, that you are magnifying and multiplying our efforts and that you are leading us towards wholeness. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.